Um, now, also the Master Bhava Viveka uh, does not make explanations of the meanings of prati and so forth. Now we have the great advantage here with respect to Praticha Samapada that um, Bhava Viveka criticized uh, Buddha Palita for his refutation of the Sankhya's uh, production from self. He found it inadequate and as we've pointed out previously, uh, on the surface, uh, a couple of the things that Buddha Palita said indeed were off. Uh, and so Bhavaveka had reason to find fault with him. And uh, that's our fortune, really, because it stimulated discussion. And Chandrakirti came to the defense of Buddha Palita and um, which then stimulated more, <laughs> more discussion. And then it set up a situation where uh, Chandrakirti was uh, intent on finding fault <laughs> with Bhava Veka for uh, other problems like, hey there you, Bhava, Ve Bhava, Bhava Viveka or Bhavya, as he's also called, you didn't even etymologize uh, Praticha Samadpada, oh fool that you are, or, you know, somebody who's stumbling around in the dark. You didn't even notice that our great leader Nagarjuna himself showed uh, uh, that he was etymology hinting at hinting at his etymolo etymology of Paticca Samuppada when in his uh, I should move my no, I have to move it way up here for you to see it. Hinting in his 60 stanzas of reasoning. Um, <laughs> hinting, this is a Tibetan bag. Hinting. <laughs> this will be my COVID mask. Hinting in his 60 stanzas of reasoning that he was, that he had an etymology of Praticca Samutpada when he, when he said, and you can, let's see, which, where's the, uh, let's see, that's the, that's the, uh, recording for posterity and I can't even figure out where the oh that, that must be there right yours yes it says tut tut propya yadut panam note panam sobhavata now you probably can't quite see that some of the letters are falling off. But, and some of the threads are falling off. The students at the old Injigomba, where I did some teaching outside from time to time, uh, I forget who it was, uh, sewed this. Oh yeah, there are this, I don't know about the letters. Tut tut propya yadut panam not panam tut. Oh, the letters have totally survived. But some of the design of the 
wheel um, just in one place on the outside but in several places on the inner inner one have, have fallen apart because I wore it so much and uh, of course on the on the edge uh, it's fallen apart wore it a lot Anyway, so, because I said it so much, and so people, the people who were listening, the listeners, would, once I would start it, they'd chime right in. Tat tat prapya yadut panam, not panam tat. Oops, I'm holding it up in the wrong place. Tat tat prapya yadut panam, no panam tat swabhavata. So you see, the father himself, right, Nagarjuna, referred to as Yap, showed us what he thought because he substituted Prapya for Praticha. He substituted another indeclinable uh, Prapya. And so that said, that told us that he felt that Praticha should not be taken simply as a declinable. Uh, it means having depended, although in English having depended would be a declinable. You know, having depended would be a, um, this actually escaped me the other day. It would modify some noun and therefore would be, it would be a past participle. Ah, I got it today. <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit of a grammatical nut, uh, so it's a bit weird for me to forget something that easy in grammar. Past participle, once it's a participle, uh, you can identify what it's modifying. Um, so it's an adjective, like an adjective. So it's... Um, you know, it's modifying something. So, um, this clicker, which Tarba reminded me to use, having been made, was sent to Boonesville, Virginia, which is where I am. People always think it's a joke when I say I live in Boonesville. This Boonsville is also a generic name for somebody who lives in the boonies. Because Daniel Boone <laughs> went on a big, big hike so, through the woods, the woods of America. So if you want to say you live way out in the country, you say, I live in the boonies. Well, a lot of the boonies are called Boonsville. And this place is called Boonesville. There's even a sign down the road. <laughs> I don't know who put it there in their front lawn. I don't think there's no government of Boonesville. There's not even a store now. There's not even a post office. There used to be a store run by Miss... I've forgotten her name now. But the store is now somebody's home. So anyway, Boonsville, the road to Boonsville. People think you take the road to Boonsville, and then they laugh. As I've said before, the police and the rescue squad just call this Egypt. 
Egypt to be better known than Boonesville. But Egypt, again, is generic and refers to this whole area. They painted the lines in the road up in this direction, which is maybe a few miles away. The lines in the road end. And then it's Egypt. Anyway, it's not that, you know, anyway, blah, blah. How did I get off on that? Anyway, it's a, it's an indeclinable and um, in Sanskrit, and it means something like having dependent. So what does propya mean? I think most, well, I don't know, I don't want to disparage most translators, but uh, you, you mostly you don't want to translate it as having met. Having met causes and conditions. It's really uncomfortable to translate it that way. But you can't understand the problems that the non-Buddhist grammarians have with this. Uh, because if cause, if an effect meets its causes, then uh, effect and causes would have to be simultaneous. Like, you know, I met the mailman the other day, and I, you know, I say, well, you couldn't meet him if he was passed. You know, if he had died, or he had already gone on to the next mailbox, you couldn't have met him. So, the material that you've read on this, uh, the non-Buddhist grammarians, and the sect called grammarians, doesn't refer to all grammarians, because there are Buddhist grammarians who, who don't have a problem with met meeting because it's been worked out. Although you yourselves, if you read this carefully, may still have problems with meet, met, because of all the trickery that's, oh, excuse me, all the uh, fine distinctions that are used to get around the problems. Excuse me for saying, for saying trickery. <laughs> Splitting of hairs. What else do we say? Okay. So, Ch Chandra Kirti is wagging his what? Wagging his finger at Baba Viveka and saying, "You didn't even read the sixty stanzas of reasoning." Meaning, you know, that's a broader ac accusation in a sense, but you didn't even notice that our great leader Nagarjuna said tat tat prapya yadut panam no panam tat swabhavata you didn't even notice the usage you know that he was pointing out to us that he was taking praticha as a as an indeclinable okay so um and so chandrakirti noticed that Bhava Viveka down three in three indents down, three more indents down, when that he cited when this is that arises from you know a really great quote from Nagarjuna's precious garland, because Nagarjuna did cite something else. No, sorry, he did write something else. When this is, that arises, like long, when there is short. 
So also you get some sense of what arises means. Arises can mean is produced, but it also can mean comes into being. And not the, you know, short doesn't come into being. After long comes into being. This is simultaneous. You only have short when you got something long. And then based on Bhava Viveka's having cited this, um, when this is that arises like long when there is short, uh, Chandrakirti puts it together. You see, he's constructing what Bhava Viveka must have been thinking. Um, due to this condition that arises. Now, easily, Bob Vega could have brought that one up. I don't have the source, I believe. In. Okay. Says, the meaning of conditionality. Okay, good, sorry. Didn't look at the note earlier. The meaning of conditionality is the meaning of Praticca Samadpada. Yeah, he puts the Bhavaveka sighting of the precious garland in, con in um, a philosophical context of Pratyatata. I don't think it's idam Pratyatata, which Chandrakirti eyesight later on from Chandrakirti's clear words. Um, and so he says, and then Chandrakirti uses this example, which as far as I know is not used by Bhavadeka. But I don't think he's uh, tricking, you know, putting something in Bhavaka's mouth that Bhavaka, you know, that he's slipping in uh, a trick in order to, uh, to turn Bhavaka into a straw man with a false uh, comparison, like the term Aranya Tilaka, wild sesame. Wild sesame, you know, why do you go out and get sesame? Not in the forest, wild. But what do you, how do you use sesame? You press it and you get sesame oil. But if you go out in the forest and get wild sesame, you can't press it and get oil. It doesn't meet your expectations. So, Aranya Tilaka is something that um, doesn't meet your expectations. Um, now, I'm not sure, you know, I can explain what wild sesame means. And <laughs> you would think that because I just explained it, wild sesame doesn't have the qualities of cultivated sesame. Now you would think that I did an etymology on it, you know, wild, um, sesame of the forest, sesame of the forest, w would be more literal. And that, and that I did an etymology on it. But what Chandrakirti is saying is, wild sesame just means something that doesn't meet your ex expectations, and you can't et etymologize it. But it seems to me that I just etymologized it. Forest sesame. 
But maybe I didn't etymologize it. Well, Jeffrey, uh, uh, isn't this, that's like an idiom kind of, no? In this case. I think you, okay, maybe you've been able to explain it. And it, you just take it as an idiom for something that doesn't meet your expectations. You found it in yeah, the so forest. That would be the distinction. Okay, an idiom. Uh, if you get blueberries in the forest, you're you're stimulating me. You can eat them. They do meet your expectations. Blackberries in the forest, for instance, in Vancouver, we go out and along the highway, and we pick them and eat them. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Could it mean something like, just as you cannot extract any essence out of wild sesame, in the same way you cannot extract any deeper explanation from the word Pratitya Samutpada, like this? Yeah, uh, of Pratitya anyway. But that's not an etymology. What Losang Tuyu is saying is it's just an idiom. Whereas forest blueberry, you can eat it, I'm adding. What Chandrakirti, to repeat what I said earlier, Chandrakirti is thinking that, that Bhavaveka would agree entirely with this that you can't unpack Aranya Tilaka the way you could unpack, um, you could take uh, Prapya and unpack that to get some parallel f for It would tell you, it would tell you how to unpack Pratitya, which still has to be unpacked. It has to be unpacked. The E in the middle is the verbal root uh, for going. E, E or I, I forget, is it long I? And the Ya, it indicates it's an indeclinable. The T is is a some sort of infix that's required. Prati loses its meaning. Well, you know, you've read about it. Loses its meaning. Blah blah blah. You still have to unpack the prati and the in the elements of the itya, it, it, you have to form it. Just as prapya, the ya indicates the that it's a, uh, like a like a pa It's not a past. I'm just using English now, past participle, but it's not. It's an indeclinable in indicator. Hmm. Okay, that's about as far as we can go on that. Now, so this is what Chandrakirti himself says. Objection. Bhava Vega says such, asserting that pr Pratichya Sanapada is a term the meaning of which is determined by conventional usage. Ah, idiom's good. And, now I moved like Aranya, Tilaka, and so forth, up here after the and. And, like Aranya, Tilaka, and so forth, does not have the character, and s character set forth in its etymological explanation. So 
So, Chandrakirti says, that also is not feasible. Why? Because Nagarjuna spoke within dividing the term Paticca Samuppada in, into its components, Paticca, Den, and Samuppada, Jung, in his 60 stanzas of reasoning as Prapya and Upanam. Now, Prapya, unfortunately, here's the unfortunately, came into Tibetan also as Den. It should have come into Tibetan as Che, meet, having met. There doesn't appear to be any translation into Tibetan as Che. So you can't read Tibetan and appreciate Nagarjuna's 60 stanzas of reasoning. Prapya didn't come into Tibetan as Prapya. It came into Tibetan as Praticha. So people throw up their hands and say, what's Chandrakirti saying? It didn't come into, Prapya didn't come into Tibetan as Prapya. It came into Tibetan as Praticha. So, somebody has to know Sanskrit in order to, right, understand why Chandrakirti cites the 60 stanzas of reasoning. It's like tat tat praticha, yadu panam, not panam tat svabhavata. The Tibetans and, in, and Indian scholars who translated Sanskrit texts into Tibetan were so good that any little mistake like this, not translating Prapya as Chek, meet, met, met, M-E-T, is like, it's a rare find. So people write articles, oh, the translators weren't perfect. I didn't write an article like, oh, wow, I'm so great, I found a mistake. But I did write a note. But trying not to say, I'm great, I found a mistake. Out of the thousands and thousands of pages of those translated by those great translators. Okay. Because he has, he has to assert just that long comes into, that long comes to be upon meeting to short and upon having depended on short or in reliance upon short. Therefore, the Honorable My Own System is because prati is used for meeting and e is used for going, which has the continuative affix ya on that e root through being modified by the modifier prati. Once you have prati before e, it's used for meeting. That is, that is to say, relying or depending. Now here's how you get three meeting, three meanings: meeting, relying, depending. The verbal root e alone is generally used for going. In one way, this is a real torture, but it's the setup. 
for all that's to come. But when it is combined with prati, when you combine e with prati before it, prati it comes to mean meeting and so forth. And so forth means relying and depending. Like, for example, what was already introduced, when the water, but Chandrakirti says sweet water of the Ganges, as long as you're not tasting it in, in uh, Benares. Kishigen and Lothar said, oh, no, no, no. The water of the Ganges is in Benares is fantastic. He went for a swim. He said it did a lot for him. And I thought, oh, you must have really been sick. <laughs> the water of the Ganges is indeed extremely sweet, but when it mixes with the ocean, when it gets to the ocean, it comes to have a salty taste, right? Because the ocean is very big. Moreover, in that way, turning into clear words, okay, that's clear enough. And then the the poetry we don't read, need to read. And then Samutpada, there's no question about that. Arising also is meaning existing. As we read earlier with Jayan Shiva, Jayan Shiva gets the, the Indian Panditas, he gets it from um, the affirmation, not from great vehicle persons, but lower vehicle, what? Vasubandhu's commentator, I forget. Vasumitra. Vasumitra? Oh, thank you. Was it Vasumitra? Doesn't ring right with me. Huh? Who? Got somebody else? Stiramati? Really? You affirm that from seeing it on the page or hearing it with your right ear? <laughs> the, the gong is, there's a minor gong when it's right. Somebody else, wasn't it? Anyway, tell me next time. So now remember, at the end of a couple paragraphs down, in general, meet, rely, and depend indeed are even said to be synonymous. Nam trangba, different forms of each other, different formats of each other. For the Tibetanists among you, Tunchik Mingi Nam Trang, that's really synonymous. But at least different formats. But, wow, meat? And later on, of course, as you've already read, there's all this footwork that that causes approaching cessation and the effects approaching production. Wow. I mean, I've heard that a lot. I had to face it a lot in translating Giant Shiva. The causes approaching cessation. <laughs> my approaching going to town and my husband's approaching coming home because he's away in Richmond. <laughs> so 
So I'm going to go to town when he arrives home. So his approaching arriving home and my approaching going to town will be simultaneous. Right? That's probably true. <laughs> you can't. You can't deny it. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> is it just all to just uh, assure that the cause is not present when the uh, I mean the effect is not present when the cause is there? Right. That's what the uh, not yeah. Buddhist grammarian said you can't even use samudpada it doesn't make any sense as a word with pratiji if yeah. as it implies that the effect is already there when you have the cause so by meeting you don't they're, they're not overlapping I right, to get exactly at. exactly yes train it one <laughs> you say I'm not I'm not Trinity one. <laughs> I'm not getting the fingers to exactly align. Uh, I, I think arising like, upon meeting. I, so I think the indeclinable and the continuative is important because the indeclinable doesn't have any taint like of the object itself, right? It's not modified by the object, it stands by itself. And yet a continuative <laughs> can make it um, oh. <laughs> well that's cute or dynamic without okay right. that that's cute <laughs> uh, you've you've become a true debater. I bow my head <laughs> okay. So now we get the three types. So that, so, but let us treat them separately to facilitate understanding. So, arising upon having met, arising upon, so that one shared. And this is, I'm not seeking to pass over this quickly, but you can read it, right? Everything's readable. But stop me if you want to ask something. <clears throat> I think this is really nice, you know. Somebody raises a qualm, some people. Your way of speaking is one that never existed before. You Buddhists are double talkers. It's not reasonable that the term dependent arising indicates no production and no cessation. These Perfection of Wisdom Sutras are talking nonsense. You're talking dependent arising and yet you're saying no production and no cessation. Just as you're saying a child was born would not mean that you're saying a child was not born. You know, let's say you're a couple and somebody asks, you know, either the father or the mother, oh, the child was born, but it wasn't born. That puts you in the psych ward. So Buddhists belong in the psych ward. And so, so then some Buddhists say, well, meditate on it and you'll figure it out. And Gelukpas say, learn the nuances and verbally it'll make sense and then 
a real Gelukpa will say, that's not all there is to it. You have to realize all that's refuted and all that's affirmed by those nuances. You have to go through a shattering emotional experience and a finding of a non-finding and what should be added to that? That will be in the end as the fifth Dalai Lama says like finding a jewel that because finding a jewel is like finding a panacea. So we've talked moving down paragraphs the simultaneous and now we've gotten it straight that grammarians are not the Buddhist grammarians because <laughs> the Buddhist grammarians have, I'm joking, talked themselves into accepting idiocy sorry, taught themselves have learned the nuances. And then Hopkins quotes his own how much does meditation on emptiness cost? $80 book, or is it $100 now? Meditation on emptiness, because he's always selling books. As one person said, I've got your book. And I said, where is it? The person immediately understood and said, it's up on my shelf. <laughs> but some people have, have actually read it. And I thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> so if you apply ultimate analysis to this kind of statement, if the cause is approaching cessation, the cause must exist. As Vicky was saying, and the effect, well, the cause would exist, wouldn't it? She's maybe going to hold me to that. If the effect is approaching production, then the effect would have to exist. So when you plant corn, what are you planting? Planting. You're planting the, the corn cob, the corn that you buy in the store, right? You're planting the corn, corn stalk that has corn, do you call them corn cobs, corn? What are those things that you buy in the store? Uh, cob. But it's, the cob could have no corn on it. You're, you're, you're planting a kernel. But you plant a kernel. But you say, I planted corn. You say, I planted an oak tree.
Yeah. Oh. That page didn't want to stay. Any questions? You have five minutes. The guy so just showed up. Yes? Oh, I, had, I did have one question that's more generally related to the whole process of emptiness coming to mean dependent arising and vice versa. Yes. Which is just when we have this mutual sparking of realizations going on, I'm a little confused, and this is a general uh, confusion when it comes to realizing whatever um, slightly hidden or, you know, phenomenon. It's like you have to use the reasoning at first to get a reliable cognizer, an inferential reliable cognizer, and that's always in relation to a particular subject. So like a sprout is empty or truly existent because of being dependent arising. So after you realize that out that this that's the sprout is empty of inherent existence. Does that mean that every you realize every sprout is empty of inherent existence? Every instance of sprout is empty of inherent existence. And then, if that's the case, then wouldn't it not really take that long before you realize, like all of the general, you know, objects that we perceive throughout our, you know, lives in general, that all of them are inherently existence are empty of inherent existence because. You know, once you realize, you know, chair, phone, computer, house, then pretty soon it basically covers all the categories of things we experience. So what's the need for this, you know, uh, back and forth sparking of realizations? Because you basically come to realize all the things around you are empty pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm confused about that. There is one of the scholars will be studying says that the mutual reinforcement of the understanding of emptiness takes place of emptiness and dependent arising takes place with the understanding of emptiness by valid cognition. Uh, generally that you will see that that is not accepted. But one scholar does hold that. Uh, Arya Deva says, when you understand with understood with valid cognition, the well, Tsongba explains his quote, his meaning, uh, when you understand the emptiness of one thing with valid cognition, as long as the functioning of that realization remains, you need merely turn your mind to any other object and you will understand its emptiness. Now the promotion of the understanding of dependent arising what con what constitutes that as opposed to being able to understand the emptiness of any other object that you turn your mind to, you know, one by one. What does it mean to, fur you know, what does it mean f to further your understanding of dependent arising, to deepen your understanding of dependent arising? 
is anything said, I think I'm just raising questions, for us to be on the lookout in all of these chapters for anything said in this line. You know, it's said... You don't fall into nihilism. <laughs> that said, gaining more appreciation of the dependent arising. So I'm saying, I don't know. Um, So, you surely have to go one by one and, and you nicely, you, you nicely, when you went one by one, you moved it to categories. You broadened the, the scope of what you were moving to, I really appreciated how you went one by one, expanding the one by ones to categories, <laughs> which uh, uh, made it go faster. <laughs> Jaya Sheva, I, I'm caused to think about the enthusiasm that bodhisattvas have with regard to compassion to go into details huh. and if there is a corresponding enthusiasm with regard to wisdom which is opposite <laughs> you know you're opposite with regard to uh, wisdom, opposite to what you said. You so uh, intelligently said to not go into categories, but to go into details. <laughs>